Hi, good morning, good afternoon, depending on uh, where you're calling in, in from. I wanted to welcome everybody to today's webinar session that we've done in collaboration with Solar City. We'll be exploring leadership trends and best practices in corporate renewables and energy procurement today. I'm Bryce Yonker, uh, Clean Edge Director of Business Development, and for today's session we have about 250 registered participants from around the nation and beyond. Just a couple quick housekeeping notes as we get started here. Um, everybody, as they probably know, is in a listen-only mode, so you won't be able to uh, join in with your audio, but we do welcome as much participation as possible. So if you're familiar with the dashboard and go to webinar, it will be very easy. You go over to the chat box in the questions field. That's where you can enter your questions, and we will be seeing those and working them into today's session. Also for to today's webinar, we have a two-page infographic briefing on the topic that we're going to be discussing. You can access that in the handouts drop-down of your GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, we'll also be sending people reminders to that if they haven't accessed it already. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Ron, and uh, he'll be our um, moderator for today's session. Uh, thanks, Bryce, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. As, as Bryce mentioned, we're going to dig into corporate clean energy procurement and really try to understand best practices and emerging trends. Uh, you know, from a background of really a lack of meaningful and comprehensive national energy policy uh, and, and that sort of being stuck in gridlock, in many ways it's been corporations along with cities and states playing the leading role in enabling a clean energy build out. Uh, many of these innovators have embraced significant renewable energy targets and for corporates, that's often been up to uh, targeting 100%. Uh, with us today, to really help us understand a host of these emerging trends and discuss these procurement strategies and best practices are Bill Wheel, Director of Sustainability at Facebook. Uh, thanks for having you. Great to have you here, Bill. Cyrus Wadia, VP Sustainable Business and Innovation at Nike. Lisa Tawney, Director of Utility Innovation and Chair of the Renewable Energy at World Resource Institute, where she has worked on the buyer's principles and the creation of REBA, uh, the Renewable Energy Business Alliance, and Eric Fogelberg, SVP Commercial Sales and Storage Solutions at SolarCity. Um, as Bryce mentioned, uh, the webinar is made possible via our partnership with SolarCity. I want to thank SolarCity for making this and other recent webinars on the topic of corporates and government and renewable energy initiatives possible. As a reminder, our goal is to make these webinar sessions as interactive as possible. So as Bryce mentioned, please go in and type in your questions. We usually get a couple dozen questions and are able to get to uh, about six or so of those. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please type those in. Um, before we begin, I want to take just a few minutes to look at what's driving corporate clean energy leadership. Uh, earlier this month, uh, our firm Clean Edge released the latest version of the Corporate Clean Energy Leaders Universe. You can see the companies here. Um, in that universe, we recognize corporations that are leading the way in establishing RE commitments, deployment of clean energy, and investment in clean tech deployment. Uh, as more companies transition away from fossil fuels to clean energy, the Corporate Clean Energy Leaders Universe provides a key barometer of innovation, best practices, and leadership. Uh, during our most recent evaluation period, four new companies were added. AMD, HP, VF, Corp, and Wells Fargo, and one company, Curry Green Mountain, was removed uh, as they were acquired by a privately held company. As you can see by looking at this universe, it spans major retailers, technology firms, consumer product firms, and financial organizations. Um, to get into the index, companies must be listed on a U.S. major exchange, the NYSE, the NASDAQ, or Amex and have a market cap of at least one billion. Uh, once they pass through that screening process, we were left with the 37 companies that you saw on the prior slide. Um, as of July 1st, as you can see here, uh, these companies represented a combined market cap of more than $4 trillion, 4.36 to be exact, and revenues of just over $2 trillion. The breakouts here, as you can see with the legend, show the percentage of companies, market cap, and revenue by sector. Um, among the indicators we track, 25 of the 37 companies have a stated goal of getting 100% of their total electricity from renewables, 
Uh, currently, uh, they get 25% or more of their electricity from renewables, again, 25. And 25 participate in one or both of the BRC and the uh, Corporate Renewable Energy Buyers Principles. You can also see the other breakout there, about ha about 12 or 12 of them uh, are in the top 25 of, of solar capacity uh, in the U.S. Um, quickly, a, a number of developments are driving this shift. Uh, it, it's quite remarkable, and I, I think this slide really tells the story because perhaps no uh, trend is greater than the significant decline in both solar and wind deployment costs over the past decade. And as you can see in this line graph, Average levelized costs for solar PPAs have gone from around 22 cents per kilowatt hour in 2006 to less than 5 cents per kilowatt hour in 2015. Uh, between 2006 and 2014, wind power PPAs dropped from 5 cents kilowatt hour to 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour. The 2015 numbers weren't in at the time of creation of this uh, line graph. Um, this significant reduction in costs has made clean energy procurement increasingly popular among corporates. Um, let me now uh, just walk you through, because this is really what we're spending a lot of our time today, but you know, how are corporations meeting these pretty aggressive procurement goals? Um, there are a number of methods, many of which uh, we'll, we'll dig into a bit more today, but, but let's look at what they are. So one opportunity is renewable energy certificates. Uh, this provides many corporations an, an entry point or floor and, and into their RE procurement strategy and marketplace. Uh, On-site renewables, uh, in particular distributed solar, uh, are being widely adopted. Uh, community solar, which, which primarily has been used by individuals and residential and some governments, but which could be a growing opportunity in the coming years for CNI customers. Uh, power purchase agreements, uh, or PPAs, which are basically long-term agreements to purchase the output of solar, wind, and other installations, and of course there are variances to that, like the virtual PPA, and green energy tariffs, primarily found in regulated markets where customers uh, might have the ability to uh, purchase uh, green electrons directly from their utility. Um, for, for, for those of you that are interested, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, Bryce did, that we produced a, a two-page document uh, with Solar City overviewing many of these tables, charts, um, and so you can access that right from uh, the GoToWebinar uh, handout section or go to the Clean Edge website. Well, I I'm very excited about today's conversation. So I'd like to move to our panelists uh, to explore more deeply what's driving the shift. So we're going to start with Bill. Um, Bill, Facebook has been a pioneer in renewable energy procurement. Um, the, the company currently gets, uh, from what I understand, about 35% of its electricity supply from clean energy sources with a 100% target and an interim goal of around 50% by 2018. Uh, from your perspective, what's most driving Facebook's renewable energy initiatives? And, and I don't, I'll give you a laundry list here, but maybe you'll tell me if it's this other stuff or what's driving it, but is it sea level support, you know, shareholder customer engagement, which are two different things, climate, environmental concerns, locking in energy costs. Tell us what's really driving this from your perspective. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ron. That, that's that's great, and and it's great to be here. Um, I would say the the short answer it's all of the above and a little bit more. Um, we, um, uh, it, sorry, I'm I'm being a little inarticulate this morning. I think it's just a little bit too early. But um, it's not, and it's not just uh, shareholders and customers. I would call it stakeholders because it's it's um, all of our employees and and other stakeholders as well as users on. Facebook, which are not really our customers, um, uh, the energy costs matter, and in, engaging in clean energy procurement helps us manage those costs and helps us avoid volatility in those costs going forward, and that's important. Um, uh, at the same time, energy costs are not an enormous fraction of our overall costs, so um, I don't think we would do it just for that. I think the thing that's interesting today about clean energy is you, you look at that graph you showed a few minutes ago, um, we really have hit a tipping point where the costs of clean energy are such that in many cases, uh, wind or solar is the lowest cost option. Mm. And so if you want to do something that uh, makes good sense for the environment and that helps us drive progress in the energy sector around cleaning up the grid, 
Um, the really wonderful thing today is you can do it in a way that actually makes good business sense. It might cost you less today, or if not, will give you other financial benefits in terms of fixing your costs and, and reducing volatility. So, so it's really all of the above. It's something that I would say is, has come to be expected by a broad range of stakeholders, um, but it's something that really makes good business sense today. And, and Bill, just to dig a little deeper on it before we move on to the next speaker, um, how much of this is being driven from the sea level all the way to the top? Is that kind of what, you know, because you, obviously you guys got involved a little bit earlier than some other folks. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, I, it, it definitely comes from the executive team, um, but also, as I said, from uh, stakeholders across the company and outside the company. We're, we're hearing this from employees. You know, maybe that's partly because uh, a lot of our employee base is millennials, um, that we certainly have people who aren't like me. Um, but, uh, you know, the, and I think millennials probably on average more expect companies and the organizations they're part of to reflect their values and to to take action on climate and so on. But it's also coming from the, the uh, executive suite as well. Mark Zuckerberg has certainly talked quite a bit about climate change as being an issue that as a, as a society we need to address and work together to address. Great. All right. Thanks a lot. We're, we're going to move on now to, to, to Cyrus. And Cyrus, you know, Nike has obviously a massive global footprint, tens of thousands of employees working around the globe on design, marketing, logistics, retail. And then, of course, you have, uh, I believe, some of your own direct manufacturing. I might have that wrong. You can fill me in. And, and certainly third-party contracted manufacturing. How did Nike make this pretty big decision to go for 100% renewable electricity. You recently joined the RE100. I, I know the target's by 2025. What can you tell us about some of your current efforts in, in, in working to meet this goal? Cyrus? Yeah. Uh, hey, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here, first and foremost. I appreciate it, Ron and Bryce, for organizing this. You know, our, our commitment to reach 100% renewable in company-owned or operated facilities by 2025 is, is no small feat. And what this implies is that we're gonna to transition to 100% renewable energy where we have the ability to make those energy purchasing decisions. So as you had mentioned, there, there's a broader footprint here as well that we can discuss. But let me, let me start with context, because you asked the question why or how. And that is, you know, we have to start with climate change. Climate change to us, just like probably most everybody on this conference call, is a global issue that requires global solutions. And we have a responsibility to act and innovate for our business, for our athlete, and quite honestly, for the future of sport, which is why we're pursuing this goal. You know, energy efficiency and renewable energy are components of our broader climate strategy to help progress. But our approach includes reducing the carbon footprint in our materials that go into our product, as well as really leveraging our relationships with our factory partners abroad to drive energy efficiency within the supply chain in addition to this target. Um, so that's, that's in some sense the impetus of how we got here. Uh, just kind of a, a commitment to sort of the, the global science target based uh, approach to climate change. And Nike is right there and kind of leading the charge, I hope, especially with this new commitment to renewables. But let me give you a little bit more texture, too, and why we think it's important to our business. So we know that we need to find innovative approaches to reduce our climate impact, not only because it's important for uh, the future growth of our company, but also because it makes sense for our business. And, you know, we often say that Nike exists to serve the athlete, to enable unlimited athletic potential, and that climate – Climate-related issues are part of that. Pollution, extreme weather conditions, they all impact an athlete's ability to perform. Um, secondly, climate uncertainty presents challenges to our business. As a global company, just like uh, some of the others on this call, we have a diverse set of operations. And um, I think this is where we, we like to talk about resilience, resilience in our supply chain, resilience in our energy procurement, and how do we manage uh, those dis future disruptions, reducing costs, and really innovating our new, op new, new operating models. So I think just to kind of put a footnote on it, there are many reasons why a company like Nike would pursue this. Number one, um, we want to be right there in line with the rest of the world on science-based targets for climate. Um, number two, 
uh, we're trying to, you know, our mission is to serve the athlete, and we believe this is part of serving the athlete and the community that the athlete exists in. And then number three is uh, we're pursuing this for a reliable, stable energy supply and uh, mitigating future down, downstream risk. Excellent. All right. So thank you for giving us sort of that background of what's driving some of this. And for those on the call, really this, this concept of science-based climate initiatives is pretty important because I think there's a lot more rigor now coming around this to really uh, demonstrate what exactly these initiatives are, are how they're impacting a company's uh, overall, uh, you know, interaction with climate. So thank you for bringing that up, Cyrus. Um, Letha, um, you know, in your role at WRI, Reba, you, you've worn so many different hats, uh, doing really incredible work as an NGO, and, and you've had a front row seat in helping to guide a range of corporates in addressing their clean energy procurement needs. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, Nike's view and Facebook here, but maybe you could help us represent some of the other voices that are out there. So for the other corporates that are on today's webinar, because we have quite a few of them, that are just starting to think about deploying such a strategy, what are maybe some of the biggest obstacles they might face in creating a successful corporate clean energy procurement program? Uh, I know it's weird to focus on the negative, but if you could say, like, where, where are the obstacles? Where are the tough points for these organizations? Lisa? Thanks, Ron. So I think the, the key obstacle that we see when companies start down this path is, is simply being overwhelmed by the complexity of the U.S. regulatory structure in electricity. So you outlined, I thought, um, very concisely several of the options they have for buying. And the reality is most of these companies pursue many of those within their strategy. And the learning curve on that can be pretty tough. So in the U.S. you have markets where uh, renewables are very competitive and other markets where uh, power prices, uh, retail power prices are very low and renewables aren't yet competitive. You have markets where you have retail choice and you can choose who provides your electricity. And you have many more markets where you have to deal with a monopoly utility. They may not be able to articulate clearly to you what your green power purchasing options really are. Um, and I think that that learning process can be daunting for a facilities team or a sustainability manager who has a really broad portfolio otherwise and has many other uh, tasks on their plate. Uh, and so, and, and that's part of the reason that we brought REBA together. REBA houses several initiatives by several NGOs that uh, really try to work consciously in a cooperative way to simplify those paths for companies to help you navigate which uh, approach is going to make the most sense for your corporate strategy, whether that's you know, how long you sign contracts for or the way you address risk or how your accounting de department addresses Sarbanes-Oxley rules on hedging and, and so on. Uh, I think there's a great many resources out there. Um, if you're thinking about target setting, uh, RE100 is a great place to start. And uh, if you're thinking about, gosh, how do I do this? Um, the REBA network, uh, that's what we stand there ready to do. Whether you've set your targets or you're just thinking about it, uh, that's, that's what we're trying to help folks move down the path on. Great. And, and I want to let everyone know in the two-pager that I talked about earlier, we have a Whole, whole range of resources and, and every organization we just mentioned is listed there. Um, mm -hmm. Letha, thank you for that. And, and I want to say, you know, this whole idea of sort of streamlining, creating best practices and standards so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel each time is, is, it seems critical to me, and I'm glad to see that that's happening. Um, Eric, mm -hmm. um, wh while many people think of Solar City as a residential solar company, uh, for the past two years, I think it's important to note the company's installed more commercial solar capacity in the U.S. than any other provider, and that's based on GTM's U.S. PV leaderboard. Um, you've worked with thousands of, of CNI customers. It, it, as you work on site and, and now increasingly utility scale and community scale, um, how do you see your CNI offerings unfolding, and, and what's the marketplace starting to look like? So over to you, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, you know, PV and storage has obviously really evolved over the last decade for CNI. I think kind of in the early days, it was a world of buying recs, or maybe some folks were deploying, you know, DG on site, whether it's rooftop, carport, et cetera. 
and solar friendly states. Now, as you kind of noted before, you've got a huge drop in PV, BOS costs, which ultimately drives down PPA rates. So then you have the advent of what I call kind of offsite solar, where these same customers are starting to look at the dereg markets, whether it's Texas, Northeast, but how can we evaluate kind of the 10 to 15 megawatt offsite projects where we can wheel power, basically enable them to have larger projects as, as a long-term head. So that was kind of the second uh, phase there. And in, in parallel, you also have storage prices dropping. So then we saw the advent of kind of integrated PV and storage really starting to take off in probably the last couple of years. So customers now starting to look at how do I leverage peak load shaving, load shifting, how do I vet decreasing capacity tags, transmission tags, all these things that impact the overall cost of energy. Now uh, we're kind of seeing the evolution into community, right? Minnesota, New York, Maryland, really starting to launch some very interesting community programs. And it's really given another way for CNI customers to leverage uh, clean energy. And, and the interesting thing, and, and Bill mentioned this, is what are, what are the benefits of their employees as well? Obviously, they can be anchor tenants for community, you know, leverage it for their own, for their own use. But we're working with a lot of folks on different models where they can either host arrays to lock down the KWH, not only for themselves, but for their employees. So leveraging it uh, to help their employees and, and, and leverage that benefit as well. So I think it's all of these things in conjunction is what CNI is looking for to, to leverage and use uh, renewables. And I think, you know, as we see this ramp in PV, I think for the first time ever uh, in 2015, solar energy beat both coal and natural gas uh, as a new uh, energy generating capacity, which is pretty amazing. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to now move into uh, the Q&A, uh, and, and we're already starting to get a lot of great questions. So um, please keep typing those in. Um, I've got a lot of questions that I've developed in advance, but uh, I'm seeing some really great ones, so we'll jump into those. So please type those in, and Bryce is handing those over to me um, throughout. Um, so I, I, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have these larger corporates uh, represented on today's panel. We thank you very much uh, for being here. You have very significant footprints. Um, but you know, we're looking at the, the webinar panelists, and we, we had a number of smaller companies. Some might be, you know, have one or two operations or facilities. Some might be a, a, a small group of retailers where they've, they've got maybe 10 or 15 facilities. But you know, these are companies that, that you know, generally have small load on site. And, and they probably lack a dedicated energy team uh, that you know these major corporates uh, would have. So how do these smaller groups make meaningful purchases? And Bill, you and I mentioned this briefly in a prep call. So you want to just tell us some of your thoughts about how some of these smaller organizations might uh, have a meaningful stake in in this transition? Absolutely. Yeah, I think. I mean, we, as as you and I have discussed in the past, we do have a, a dedicated energy team, and we have a pretty significant overall load. And uh, when we look for clean energy for a data center site, that site might need on the order of 40 or 50 megawatts, which is a lot. Um, if you've e either got a much more distributed footprint or just a much smaller footprint overall, then you you can't do the kinds of things that we're doing for those sites. But on site. Uh, distributed generation, on-site solar particularly, I think in a lot of places can make sense. So if you own your uh, facility, then that's an option. If you lease, then that raises other issues, but may still be a good option, either that you can do directly or work with your, your landlord to do. Um, community solar, as, as I think um, Eric mentioned, is a good option. Um, and um, I think the other thing that we're actually finding is that some people with smaller footprints are doing things like virtual PPAs for one or five or 10 megawatts where they're, um, uh, you know, and a, a megawatt of wind might be uh, 300 or 400 kilowatts average power, um, which is not a huge footprint. Um, so there are options that you can engage in that, that don't require going to the scale that we do or necessarily require an energy team. Um, there are plenty of service providers out there who will act as brokers and consultants um, who can, can help companies that don't have their own internal teams. And I, certainly if you don't, I would recommend looking for external expertise. Um, the Rocky Mountain Institute Business Renewable Center is set up expressly to help educate people and to help connect people to external expertise if they don't want to hire people internally. So, so I think there are a lot of options. Great. Yeah, and I just put up this slide here for everyone. Uh, these were the additional resources on the two-pager, um, and you can easily go uh, 
look up those organizations, and, and obviously BRC is one of them. Um, Letha, what's your sense? I mean, I know you work with a lot of the larger corporates, but I'm guessing some of them have smaller loads. How, how are you seeing some of the organizations that might not have dedicated resources uh, figuring out how to participate? Well, I think I think Bill outlined several of the great options. Uh, I think this is where uh, if a utility or a developer or a service provider figures out uh, aggregated options, options where customers can fairly easily subscribe to a high quality product, um, there's a really un, uh, a pretty substantial untapped market. Uh, so we see, for example, Excel in um, Minnesota putting forward a product that would be available to any commercial meter in their service territory that would bring the value of a wind and blended wind and solar power purchase agreement right onto their retail bill. So instead of RECs over and above as green power products historically have been, uh, you know, RECs is a premium on top of the retail bill, this will this will actually be embedded right in the fuel portion of, of their retail electricity bill from Excel. And I think Advocating for asking your utilities for those sorts of products is a, is a very effective way to, to get more flexibility for what are relatively smaller loads. Um, they may be pretty large when you aggregate 14 Walmart stores across a service territory, but each individual store is quite small. And uh, we're going to need more of those bulk solutions, I think, to meet the overall demand. Uh, the virtual PPAs are also a, a great solution. You can cover a, a swath of your uh, of your demand. So a virtual PPA in a region can cover, say, uh, if you wanted to, you could you could say it. it you utilized renewable energy for your facilities in that multi-state area. Um, it depends on whether your um, company feels comfortable with a virtual PPA approach. Lisa, uh, and, I think and uh, Bill pointed quick to the question. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of people on the call know what a virtual PPA is. Others don't. And even within sure. the community, there's disagreement about the definition. So can you quickly <laughs> yes. explain to people what a virtual PPA is in your definition? Sure. I, I think at its most basic, it's a financial transaction. So you may or may not take ownership of the energy, but essentially you contract to buy energy from a project um, at a fixed price, a solar project or a wind project, and then you take on the risk of selling that energy, and a broker usually does the actual transactions for you. You don't have to do the transactions, but you, you sell the energy on to the wholesale electricity market in the region that that project sits in, and if uh, that wholesale price is lower than the PPA price you committed to, you lose money. And if the wholesale price is higher than the PPA price uh, you committed to, you make money. And at the end of the month, there's a settlement. Uh, and maybe you're up and maybe you're down. Uh, and, and that goes on for the length of the contract of the power purchase agreement. So it's virtual in the sense that it's a financial transaction, not um, moving the energy yourself, taking ownership of the energy, wheeling it to your facility, um, and and it can be a powerful tool, depending. But you have to think about risk and about the wholesale price and the PPA price and and so on. The BRC has some excellent excellent guides and primers on how to tackle some of the thorny issues uh, in that space. And the bulk of the transactions we've seen in the last year uh, have been virtual PPAs. Um, you know, probably two and a half of the 3.2 gigawatts uh, that were that were contracted last year were probably virtual PPAs all told. Um, so it's a very popular, but um, but relatively complex. Um, but when it's all said and done, you can have a very large body of renewable energy certificates that you have taken from a wind farm or a solar facility that then match your actual retail footprint. Um, across the whole country, in a particular region, for a particular facility, however you uh, want to allocate them. Great. Well, thank you for helping explain that. And Eric, what about on your end with Solar City? Uh, obviously, you work with companies that probably have a range of different loads. Um, what are you finding with some of the smaller players that maybe just don't have all the dedicated teams and et cetera? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from our perspective, I, I think the advantage we, we bring to some of these folks, we've done this, you know, for thousands of sites for very large corporations. So the lessons we've learned over the various marketplaces apply, whether it's small or large consumption sites. Uh, the real challenge is kind of what Lisa said, when you're trying to do these, it's hard to pencil a 10, 50, even 100 kW project uh, as opposed to the 500 megawatt up. So the concept of working as a constituent of utilities that drive, you know, the ability to do remote, solar, virtual, aggregate meters uh, will really help out this group. But, you know, from the, from the how do they do it, you know, happy to sit down with them and talk about what we've kind of learned from a PV storage perspective and understand because these markets are changing all the time, right? That's a challenge for everyone in the marketplace. No market is the same, whether it's New York, California, they evolve. So it's really understanding how they evolve and how to get ahead or at least line up to quickly take advantage of the markets as they start to open up for you. Well, as I said earlier, there's not really a national policy, so it really does end up being state right. level, utility level. Um, so I'm starting to get amazing questions. What I'm going to do is go between the questions that are coming into the chat box and the questions I had. Um, but let me let me go to one of the first questions that came in from the audience members. Um, so so here's here's the question. So wind and solar compete on price. Uh, and I think, Lisa, you pointed out that's not true in every market, but in many markets now. Um, how do corporate buyers manage the variable nature of the power from these sources? Uh, doesn't that add additional costs that increase uh, uh, above other sources? Uh, obviously, uh, interesting uh, answers to that. So, Bill, how about I go with you first on that, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, yeah, often I think people, especially if you're not deep in the energy markets, you might think, wait, wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun right, doesn't right. shine all the time. Um, how do I deal with that? And and our facilities, and I think this is true for most people, unless you have a goal to be off-grid, um, your facility is connected to the grid. The grid still serves you. Um, you we, we are served then in Texas and in Iowa by wind farms that are located, you know, 50 to 100 miles away. Um, the, the wind doesn't blow all the time, and that means that energy needs to be firmed up so that we get energy 24-7 when we need it. Um, that is done by the local utility or in, in the case of Iowa because there's a monopoly regulated utility. In the case of Texas, there's an energy services company that does that for us. So their job is to contract appropriately to make sure that we get energy all the time. Um, the way the accounting is done for the clean energy is that, that we net out over the year the amount of wind versus the amount of energy we consume. So it is not necessarily the case that at any point in time, we are getting you know, energy from a wind farm flowing into our facility. Energy is being put on the grid by the wind farm. Our facility is taking energy off the grid. And the grid's job is to balance all the, the sources of energy, all the generators, and all the loads. Um, that does add a little bit of cost. Um, it's, it's part of the you know, sort of grid services, and, and you also need transmission and distribution. Um, our experience is those costs are are quite minimal today in most markets. Um, as the penetration of wind and solar go from 5, 10, 15, 20% to 50, 60, 80, 90%, um, which I don't think is going to happen in the next couple of years, um, uh, then those costs will almost certainly go up some. But I think we'll also find that the cost of storage and other technologies to manage that are coming down. So uh, I think there's, there's, it's likely those costs will continue to be quite manageable. We're and finding so net, including, including all those costs, that in places yeah. like Texas, um, uh, it, it nets out to be essentially uh, cost neutral to go That's with safe. wind. And, and we can, uh, at the same time, lock in the price that we're paying, which means we're not uh, subject to the, the vagaries of the commodity uh, fuel markets. And how much do you consider being in a location that might have large hydro resources or something like that as sort of, uh, you know, to, to back up the other renewables. Is that something you consider at Facebook? Yeah, um, so, so I mean, our goals are to, to green our supply. So we want to get to 100% clean energy. And we want, when we pick a new site now, to make sure that we've got access to clean energy sources. Um, we are beginning to look more carefully at what are the resources that might be available to firm up the wind or yep. solar, if yep. that's the source that we're using. And if there's large hydro on the grid, that is one potential firming resource that can be used to, to fill in for the wind and solar when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. Great. Um, anyone else want to tackle this question on sort of uh, 
you know, are well, there extra costs? Yeah, Lisa? So I just want to highlight that, that when, when Bill says the accounting, the nets out, that is the RECs. That's the Renewable Energy Certificate. So it's important to understand that the RECs still convey the ability to claim you're using renewable energy. And they um, are these strategies are RECs plus energy in a lot of cases, as opposed to RECs instead of energy or energy right. instead of RECs. Um, and that that netting um, is really important for being able to make your 100% goal uh, over the over the time frame that you're that you're accounting over, uh, and the RECs are central to that. Great, Cyrus, Eric, anything to add? Okay. Um, so uh, another question came in, um, uh, 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 and, and I think this is for Nike and for Facebook. Um, earlier I had talked about the five uh, RE procurement methods. Uh, there may be some others, but I had mentioned the five. I can put them up in a second. But um, could you guys quickly walk us through some of the various strategies you're deploying um, and, and maybe thoughts for the future? Cyrus, could, could we start with you on, and I know this is newer for Nike, but just give us an idea of, some of the things you're you're maybe looking at to 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 reach your targets. Yeah, so you know, I'll start because I, I think I can be really quick here. We uh, we just announced this target in September of last year, so we have teams in place right now that are building a plan and and how we get after this on a, on a kind of global scale. You know, we've already implemented some on-site renewables um, in some of our large distribution centers, for example. Uh, solar panels in our China Logistics Center in Taicheng and uh, solar panels and wind turbines in our European Logistics Campus in Lachdal, Belgium. And um, we have been evaluating pretty aggressively, because we want to get to this pretty quick, uh, a lot of our U.S.-based owned and operated uh, facilities. But, um, yeah, it's going to take, uh, it's going to be geographic specific, you know, as energy is and markets are, and we have... Um, a fairly uh, big team looking at how we put together the plan for our global footprint. Great. Uh, Bill? Yeah, I mean, we're pursuing most of these options. I mean, we've done on-site solar uh, here in our Menlo Park headquarters and at one of our data centers. Um, we've done in Texas, which is an open market, we, we have done basically direct wind purchase, so what would be called a physical power purchase agreement with the other uh, grid services bundled in so that we get energy when we need it. Um, uh, in uh, Iowa, we did a special contract because there was no green tariff, but what we'd like to see over time is a green tariff that allows regulated utilities like MidAmerican in Iowa to offer us green power uh, that in a way that's economically sensible for us and them and has additionality. Um, We've chosen to locate in places like northern Sweden. One of our data centers is in northern Sweden, where the grid is 100% hydro. Um, in Ireland, we've done basically direct purchase because, it, again, it's a deregulated market. Um, the thing we have not done uh, is essentially straightforward, unbundled, REC, renewable energy certificate purchases. And, and the reason for that is we want to make sure when we spend money and time or in other ways engage in the clean energy market, that what we're doing is actually having an impact in changing what's on the grid. Um, and today, in this country at least, the national wind rec market, which is the bulk of the recs that are out there, um, the recs are very cheap, which is great, but when you buy them because they're so cheap and because there really is basically a vast oversupply of them, um, you don't have much impact on the supply. In fact, I think the, there's a pretty strong argument you have essentially no impact on increasing the supply. So you're buying a marketing claim, and that's about it. Right, um, right. Five, ten years ago, that was a fine thing to do. It actually had impact on supply. Today, not so much. Uh, Eric, uh, I, I don't know how much you'll be able to talk about this, but just, you, you know, I briefly touched upon community solar earlier. Uh, it's sort of been mentioned. Mm -hmm. could, could you tell us a little bit more about how Solar City is viewing the community solar marketplace and how it might move from beyond individuals more into the CNI marketplace? Yeah, no, no, we love the market in general. I mean, I think the biggest states coming up are, you know, Minnesota, New York, Maryland are probably the most interesting. California's program really does not pencil for community. Hopefully it will be evolving next week to open up. But from from our perspective, obviously it enables you to leverage the 
you know, cost reductions of a large scale project, call it 50 to 100 megawatts. In New York, you're going to call it two megawatts uh, a project. And then either leverage it for residential offtake or for the commercial uh, entity. And like I said, it's either going to be in those cases, we're already looking at work with customers today in Minnesota and New York to, you know, carve out some of the 100 plus megawatts that we'll be deploying uh, as part of their uh, program in Minnesota or carve out if they're going to host on their sites uh, for their employees or for their own usage. So from my perspective, and it, it works for small, small customers from small load, large scale customers, it just adds a ton of flexibility because, you know, there's only so many massive rooftops, distribution centers, folks that have land in renewable uh, friendly states where they can deploy those assets. So being able to do these at large scale, I think it's going to be really, really helpful. Uh, through the adoption over the next couple of years, but I, I think it's a combination of all those things that the folks are going to leverage. Yeah, yeah I, and I if I could just to, jump in, Ron, um, I think commu community solar in particular, if you know, if you've got a small facility, um, where maybe for whatever reason, maybe your rooftop is shaded, or or it's got other issues, or you rent um, and can't, as a result, put stuff on your roof, community solar can be a great option. Um, and or community choice aggregation or various things like that that allow uh, one small business or one business to, to take part in a larger project. So I think that's also a, a really important option. Uh, yes, as someone just, with, go ahead, Lisa. Well, I just add, we just, uh, Walmart and Alabama Power just announced a collaborative deal that uh, looks a lot like community solar. You know, Walmart will be the anchor tenant on a pretty large project and other customers can can buy what's left, buy into what's left of that project. This that, was that Walmart and who, available. what was the utility? So Alabama Walmart. Power. Thank you. Alab yeah, so it, it's exciting and, and Walmart can scale its participation back if there's sufficient other interest and um, deploy their demand into the next project. So it's a, I think there's a, a powerful model here for collaboration and, and enabling by some of the larger buyers to make room for uh, some of the buyers that may have less uh, buying power in a particular market. Yeah, I think this whole concept, community solar, we talked about community choice aggregation briefly, the, the concept of share renewables uh, really is important. And, and just from my own personal experience, I had a 110-year-old elm tree in front of my house with incredible shading. All the solar companies, even my good friends at Solar City, said, no, you can't. So it's really nice to know there are, there are potentially emerging options, not only for individuals, but for the large, uh, you know, more C&I marketplace. Um, we, you know, we talk uh, we talked a little bit about additionality uh, when making clean energy procurement decisions. Uh, we didn't dig into it a lot, but we, we talked a little bit about it. But I'm wondering how important is locality or regionality when making decisions around procuring green electrons? I, I know, Bill, you mentioned, you know, maybe the source is 50 to 100 miles from where your operations are. But how important is that for you? I mean, in the early days, maybe people are buying RECs from, a, a project uh, you know, a thousand, two thousand miles away. I'm wondering if this whole idea of, of, of regionality is important to, to the folks on this call. Um, and I, whoever wants to jump in first. Uh, so this is Bill. I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think it is pretty important. It's, it's, it, you know, in the end, there are always trade-offs. So we, our primary goal is to, to green our supply to move toward a much higher percentage of renewables over time. At the same time, uh, we're putting a facility in a particular location. We're part of that community. Um, one of the benefits of, of sourcing green energy, if it's got uh, additionality, is then you're reducing, hopefully, CO2 in the atmosphere, which is a global issue. But uh, it's also important to, worry, to, to pay attention to local air pollution issues. And so if we're in a particular community, we're adding load to a grid of, in a particular place, we want to make sure that, where possible, we reduce the impact of our load in terms of, of local air pollution, not just carbon dioxide emissions. So lo regionality matters for that. In addition, we're really interested in, in playing a role in greening the grid as a whole, and that means influencing the utilities that serve us to move to a, a greener supply over time. And if we simply buy RECs, whether it's a virtual PPA or some other purchase from something that's a 1,000 miles away, the local utility really doesn't care. And so by focusing on nearby uh, wind and solar and other clean energy projects, um, that 
uh, encourages the, the local utilities for a variety of reasons to work with us to try to make sure that, that they've got options that can provide that energy to us and that they're going to move to actually clean up their entire grid over time. Great. Does anyone else want to talk about regionality? Yeah, I, I think would, I think the I, only other thing. Go ahead, Cyrus. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I'll just a quick one. So the only thing I'd add mm -hmm. from our perspective, it's 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 all about how to get deals to pencil. So if you look at DREG markets and you say, hey, I'm going to put 80 megawatts in West Texas, you know, as a new project. Now you're looking at additional congestion risk, ancillary charges from transmission distribution. You know, optimally we have to look at those projects from kind of a network node and how do we minimize moving that energy across the network. Uh, just from a cost perspective. So, you know, it's really looking at from, from an economics, how to optimally locate a project from a yield perspective, cost perspective, and then all of the other capacity or other transmission charges you may get uh, hit with. And Lisa? Oh, well, I, th I agree with both, and I would really have, so, so my work at WRI, what I lead, is is really focused on how do we help utilities meet this emerging demand and how do we help customers like um, Facebook and, and others really influence their local utility. And I would just emphasize the power of the CNI customers to move a utility, to move a governor's office, to move regulators around renewable energy. So we've seen states where renewables are, you know, verboten politically for all sorts of reasons uh, if you approach them from an environmentalist angle. Uh, but if they're wrapped up in this is what CNI customers want because it makes good business sense when you can find projects like Eric, Eric points out, that pencil, uh, the, the conversation really fundamentally changes. And I, I wouldn't a, I, I would want the folks on the phone to think about their potential to influence the communities that they're in um, positively uh, in terms of thinking about the transition to a clean energy economy as a positive, um, possible, affordable uh, step to be taken uh, in addition to all of the sorts of things that you're trying to weigh in your strategy yourself. Uh, and and don't underestimate your power as a CNI customer to change the dialogue. So yeah, locality you know, is very it, important. Ron, if I regard. could, if I could um, uh, sort Please. of build on that, um, well, I think I think the power of the customers here is actually far greater than than most people realize. And I think historically, customers mm -hmm. have not had a lot of power in in working with utilities. Um, I think the, the I want to put in a plug for the renewable energy buyers principles, which is mostly larger companies today. Um, but what we found when we moved from each of us individually going and talking to utilities and regulators and other policymakers to now banding together and speaking with a relatively unified voice, that when we then go in as one or two companies at a time to talk to a utility, we have the weight of all the other companies behind us. So I would encourage any company that's listening, that is interested in clean energy, um, if they want to try to influence not just their own operations, but the, their utility and the region they're in, um, then consider signing the buyer's principles. Um, I think every company that has signed has found it to be beneficial and really helpful in then whatever negotiations and discussions they have with utilities and regulators and others. Uh, and, and these are great points, and I, I want to just point out some research that we had done with Solar City two years in a row, and it wasn't talking with the corporate buyer, but it was talking with the, the homeowner, and really interesting, and probably not surprising to anyone on this call, but I want to reiterate that this concept of support of renewables, support of energy choice, was overwhelmingly uh, supported by both sides of the political aisle, and it, in fact, more Republicans wanted energy choice uh, than, than even Democrats. Um, the other thing I'd point out is while this is really politically charged at the national level, it didn't used to be, um, it's not so much at the state level. You know, half of the states in our top 10 for renewable energy uh, deployment are uh, red states and half are blue. So I, I love the points that are being brought up here. And yes, I, I think we can get folks out. The power of the corporates right now and the power of city governments and state governments are, are quite considerable. Um, and depending on the outcome of our next election cycle, uh, you know, 
will continue to have a very important role. Um, I want to talk a little bit about energy storage. Um, you know, we, we, we touched upon it briefly. Uh, it seems that, you know, you look at the wind costs. Uh, Ten years ago, people didn't think wind would necessarily drop so much, but it came down to half again. It was going up for a little while because of costs for materials, but it continued, continued to decline. Uh, and, and with solar, you can see that dramatic drop, and we all know about that, that experience price curve that's occurred with solar. What do, I want everyone just to put on their prognostication cap. Uh, looking out three to five years, is energy storage going to be a significant player here, both for on-site, where I kind of have the ability to uh, keep critical operations running, as well as at the utility or substation level where it might help ease the, the, the pain on the grid. Uh, Eric, why don't I start with you real quick since you guys are doing a lot of work in that area. Yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be a huge part of renewables. You know, if you look at where we are today with storage, I feel like we're in 2009 of the PV world, right? It pencils probably five or six states, early adopters like Walmart, BJ's have already deployed solar, you know, to look at for peak load shaving and a number of other folks I'm sure as well. Um, so they're looking at kind of portfolio, how to get the low-hanging fruit. But I think that we'll start to, as we start to see storage really drop in price uh, and more and more incentive programs coming out, we'll see a huge ramp in the uptake. So, you know, they'll look at peak load shaving, kind of the ancillary charge you're getting hit by, the load shifting. And then as Bill, you know, folks mentioned earlier, the challenge of the intermittent nation, nature of renewables, right? That is what utilities and CNI customers are starting to look at. Uh, leveraging storage for? How do you get rid of that intermittent nature with storage? And then utilities are starting to look at, how do I defer some of our distribution substation upgrades, right? Can I put a large enough storage project where I don't have to have those costs? So I think it's both kind of C&I uh, and utilities really leveraging uh, uh, storage over the next few years. Great. Does anyone else want to say where they think, Letha, maybe you could in your modeling, are you starting to see energy storage uh, likely having a pretty significant role, or what's your take? You know, I, I think it, it will grow as prices fall, but I think the indicators I'm noticing is that I, I'm having utilities begin to approach me about where large buyers would like to collaboratively think about storage. So as we've been, we've been building, you know, a collaboration with utilities on renewable energy procurement for the last two years, and, and they're realizing the CNI customers could be partners in these capital investments, I think, more broadly. And as we see the markets um, get to grips with capacity and, and other ancillary services, uh, I think there's going to be new opportunities for CNI customers to um, find revenue streams and, and other ways to um, make the most of either the investments they need to make anyway in backup generation or uh, investments they could be making collaboratively with utilities on storage or other um, renewable energy integration technologies. So I, I, I think that this will be the next leading edge for CNI customers as more and more get to grips with how to meet their very ambitious renewable energy goals. Uh, and we'll hear a lot more about this in, in three years. Uh, Bill or Cyrus, uh, anything to add about how you guys are viewing energy storage? I think I'd like to jump in here. Go, go uh, Bill, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, well, first off, I'm just going to reflect on uh, – Maybe my experience is before Nike in uh, in the federal government doing energy policy, and just just kind of a reminder: energy storage is not new. Um, we have been long deploying pumped hydro as a form of energy storage, as well as um, techniques in compressed air, which is <clears throat> maybe a little less prevalent. But uh, when we look at a portfolio approach, which is I think what everybody in this call has been talking about. A key enabler, in our opinion, is uh, energy storage. So a key enabler to uh, portfolio or demand response or all these new techniques that are going to allow us to dispatch energy more intelligently, um, I don't see how we do that without advances in energy storage. That being said, uh, it gets a little bit more complex because you have the residential, commercial, utility-scale markets all kind of with different needs in, in this regard. So 
I think just kind of a, a footnote is, uh, yes, believe it's a big part of the future that uh, we expect to be playing in, um, but just also uh, it's, it's not new to, the, to our energy infrastructure. Bill? We are um, uh, certainly using energy storage some. We've got, got uh, some stationary storage installed here in our Menlo Park headquarters, and we use it for um, peak shaving and to reduce our demand charges. Um, we obviously have storage in our data centers, basically for backup to ensure that, that we stay on, even if there's a glitch on the grid. Um, and I think we will almost certainly see, as everyone else has said, um, huge progress in storage in the coming years and, and um, e enormous scale and deployments to help manage the grid more effectively. Yeah, and, and, and I agree completely, Cyrus. Obviously, you know, when we, start to, we started to look at the breakout of energy storage, even just a last year, and so much of it was still pumped hydro. Um, I think, you know, looking out, we'll really see sort of how do the lithium ion chemistries and, and other, uh, you know, chemical, uh, electrochemical uh, chemistries sort of play out and sort of, you know, how is that deployed both on site and, and at, the, at the utility scale. So I, I want to thank everybody for being on this call today. Um, we had about a dozen more questions that I had and a dozen more that popped up just now, but we have hit the end of, uh, of our time. Um, I want to point out that you know these early pioneers have done a lot of hard work. Uh, they, they did a lot of it by themselves. The ecosystem is now evolving. A lot of companies are working together, um, and really provide a great opportunity for uh, for for people to learn from each other. So please go look at that two pager. Look at these resources here. I'm sure there'll be there be other groups emerging, but we are seeing a lot of these groups starting to work together. Uh, I want to thank all of the great uh, work uh, that's being done by everyone on this call today. Um, so, so, so thank you to, to Bill, Cyrus, Lisa, and Eric, and uh, uh, please note again that this has been recorded and you can check it out on our website hopefully later today or tomorrow. Thank you everybody for joining us today.